Welcome to World Talk with Friends, where the small world we live on becomes smaller as we discover neighborhoods all over the world by simply talking to our neighbors. This is Haggy Shack Radio Production, simulcast over Wolf Spirit Radio Network. Colleen Kelly is producing with friends Nancy, Nora, Renata, Neil, and those we have yet to meet. Welcome to our world. Oh, yeah. And you are live. Hello, hello again. It's uh, June 15th, 2016. This is World Talk with Friends. My name is Nancy Hopkins. You're listening to uh, Haggy Shack Radio, and our producer is Colleen Kelly. And our um, co-host kind of guest, I mean, Nora Wills is, is with us again, and she's... She's so part of this show that, you know, I just think of her as, as another host. And we just, um, she's in the midst of, of making a move, and we wanted to um, get in at least one more time before we might lose her until she can get set up where she's going. So, um, Nora, Colleen, how are we doing today? Good, good. Hi, uh, Dancy. Hi, Colleen. Hi, everyone. It's hi, nice hi. to be back. Good to have you back. Thank you so much. I've yeah. missed you all, as I was saying before. Uh, people were asking about you the other day in the chat. Oh, oh. I've been thinking about you almost just thinking. I haven't been on the chat for such a long time, but it's just been so crazy. And every time I have a minute, I just go to sleep because I'm just so exhausted. And now it's even Ramadan, so it's uh, during the day it's dead, so you can't really do anything. So, yeah, I'm just Thank thinking... You. Maybe we should back up and explain that you're in Qatar right now. Yeah, I'm still in Qatar right now. I'm in Qatar. I'm uh, moving uh, in five days. I'm leaving to uh, Italy. I'm going to Milan. And, uh, yeah, obviously Qatar is a Muslim country, so they um, celebrate or practice Ramadan and fasting. So during the day, it's quite dead. Uh, even if you want to get some chores done, it's very difficult because almost everyone works in the evening. And uh, that could be a little bit uh, difficult, you know, especially when you're moving. You need day and night. You need any time of the day to be able to do stuff. So, yeah, it's a bit challenging. But it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. So, yeah, I'll be back on the chat when I'm settled in Italy for sure. I really, really miss chatting with everyone. Now, let, let's, as long as we're still in Qatar, let's talk about Qatar because, um, again, I have a perception of a principality where the Royalty is taking care of the people because they feel that they can maintain control and power by taking care of the people. Um, that's basically what what I think of when I hear the word Qatar. Am I close? Uh, that's uh, my opinion as well. That's my opinion as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So <laughs> at least yeah. at least that was that came to me in a in a pure force. Uh, Absolutely. Now, it's a very small uh, number of people, by the way. Qatari yeah. people are very few. There are, I think, yes. just about three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand. That's it's all. It's a very small. That's a very small number. I mean, uh, there are more expats than uh, than Qataris. Well, I knew that, but I didn't realize it was that small. Now, what geographically is it? A small, small area. It's a very small area. It's a it's a small peninsula attached to Saudi, Saudi Arabia. How did they happen to escape the Saudi influence, I mean, the Saudi control? Uh, that's a good question. I really don't know that much because this is like a very, very old, it's very old history where um, when they were still, um, they didn't have, you know, all the gas and the oil and all that stuff. Um, Saudi considered uh, Qatar to be part of Saudi, but it was always kind of independent in a way. It was never really clear. Uh, but I think after Qatar became very rich, um, you know, they, they were able to have their own control. But I, I can't really speak too much because I don't know, I don't have much knowledge of that. But this is all I know. This is what I've been told. Cause I, no, I never that, really... that, could it be the, the concept of the tribes that you told us about Saudi Arabia that it really was a nation of tribes that had... Yes. Been, okay, so maybe it was a nation of, of, of tribe, a tribe that they weren't getting anything from them and they probably were a little... Could be. And so they didn't bother with them until now they're rich. And so is there any contention between Saudi Arabia and Qatar that you feel? 
Uh, I don't know. It's it's a little bit strange. Till now, politically, I don't understand what's going on. I mean, even I don't even know what's Saudi's position uh, with all this. Uh, a lot of people say that, um, and I'll speak openly about it. Um, practically, what what I understood or what I understand is that Qatar are very closely knit with uh, the. Um, I don't know if I should say this, with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in uh, in Egypt. So most of the Egyptians that come here are from the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, now, what would you, you, can we, can you we, just? Can we talk about that for a minute? The Muslim b- Sure. I, I just hope I can get out of the country. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not going to go into it. You know that that kind of no, thing. I'm just kidding. But I'm just you, kidding. You've got the 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 Egyptian. Um, influx of people into Qatar more so than other areas? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. There are so many. The biggest uh, uh, national, I mean, the largest uh, nationality here in Qatar of expats are Egyptians. Some of them aren't. Like my husband, my husband's Egyptian, but he's totally liberal. Uh, But uh, the, the, and, and our friends, our Egyptian friends that live here, but the most part are Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, you would see them. You spot them right away, and you even see some of them doing the, you know, the hand gesture. Uh, I mean, it's obvious. They have their special hand gesture, where they. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like they, four fingers up, and um, yeah. So it's very obvious. They have the beard and everything. You just spot them a mile away. Now, again, we're coming back to the concept of. Um Muslim versus the Hindu, and we're talking just Muslim uh, yeah. religion being talked about in this area. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, so again, it's the conservative side of the religion versus a more liberal interpretation that, that is still in, in, in Qatar, or is it very much conservative? Qatar is very conservative. I right. mean, on the outside. Uh-huh. Women, women can drive. Um, women put a lot of makeup on. Um, they're very dressy. Some of them are like over, I mean, you could, you just see them. You know, they have so much makeup on. They, uh, they have like expensive bags, expensive shoes. So they're very showy. They have extremely expensive cars. It's very normal to see Ferraris and Lamborghinis and, and, and Maseratis and whatever here in this country. Um, but the culture is, uh, conservative. So there's there's also schizophrenia in this area as well, like like in Saudi, but because there are so few, everyone's rich, and uh, you just don't understand. It's it's you you don't understand where their what their position is exactly. They show you that they're conservative, but you don't know really what's going on behind the scenes. So they they put on a facade or not a facade a, a yeah. persona. Let's say a persona. Of being, be, being conservative, and yet because you're seeing these very kind of like flashy signals of um, libertarian freedom, I can put makeup on, I can be flashy, I can, you know, get into the to the concept of you know more is better. Apparently, yeah, that um, uh. that would seem to erode a conservative religious position. Well, absolutely, because being, uh, from my understanding, being religious, not spiritual, for me there are two completely different things. Being religious, whether it's a Christian or Jewish or whatever religion, a big part of being religious is looking humble. That's what I understand. So you can't be a religious person. Uh, I'm talking about the concept of how people understand religion. If you're going to be flashy, whether you're a man or a woman, and Islam... Uh, they do teach you that being humble is very important if you're going to be a religious por- person. Now, I, I personally don't agree or disagree. I'm neutral to this. Everyone, everyone can choose whatever they want to do. They want to put makeup. They don't want to put makeup. They want to do this. It's all about the intention of the person. So uh, I don't judge people by their exterior. But it's just a little bit funny when they tell you that to be religious and to, to follow Islam... Uh, you have to look in a certain way, like women have to va- put a veil on their heads um, to be humble, to look humble. But then if you put a ton of makeup on and you do look attractive and sexy, because some of them really do, okay, um, that's not being humble, even if you have a veil on, because you're, uh, 
your country tells you that you have to. So you, you see what I'm saying? It's uh, mostly culture. Yes, it's very interesting. Now, yeah. um, 300,000 people living in basic luxury, I guess. It's oh, yeah. They, they really do have it. Um, it like, from, from being an outsider, how long have you been there? Uh, a year. A, a year. year this month. Yeah, more Thank than you. enough. <laughs> yeah, more, you get a flavor for something there. Um, yeah. Is, is there a, um, do, do the, do the, the, the out of towners, the the people that didn't that aren't Qatar, are they in one section and the Qatars on the other, or is it a very intermingled kind of uh, society? Well, um, I, I I must say that uh, um, in Qatar you see the Qataris more than let's say if we compare it to uh, Dubai specifically, not the Emirates as a whole, but Dubai. Um, in Dubai, you barely see uh, Emiratis. Very few. They're very much to themselves. But in Qatar, you do see them. If that's your question, I don't know if I understood you right. No, I'm just wondering. I mean, when 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 the immigrants came to America, you would have uh, the the Italians would stay with the Italians, the Irish with the Irish. You had all these oh, okay. slaves. And I'm just wondering, in a with such a limited number of people that are native to the country. Yeah. Is there a lot of intermingling? Because, again, what, what's the message that they're hearing from the people that are their neighbors? Or are they completely separated? Do, do you mean neighbors as in like in like the Saudis and those people? Or are you talking about the expats that the live expats. in the country? Well, yeah, oh, I, yeah. well, I, I think there is a small part that maybe does intermingle. But, yeah, for the most part, I think they're very much to themselves. So sort I mean, of seg- I, I it's have a segregated society, essentially. Yeah, quite, quite segregated. That's you see them the- there, and they're. Yeah, I don't think they really appreciate the uh, the 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 people that are here that much. I mean, they're polite. I'm not saying. I mean, I personally haven't had any problems. Um, even when I went, let's say, to get my account in the bank or I dealt with men or women, they, they knew I was Saudi. Even though, I mean, I I don't. I'm not the stereotypical Saudi. I don't wear a abaya, you know, the long uh, black gown with the uh, scarf. I uh, uh, sometimes I actually, you know, like even wear sleeveless shirts. You know, I don't care. So when they think, when they see, and I, I'm, you know, I have like blonde hair, and they, they they see that I'm Saudi, they get shocked a little bit, but they treat me very well. So this is something I have to really appreciate about them. Um, so they're very respectful. Uh, th- this is something I have to get from my experience. Um, they're very professional at work. Something that maybe you wouldn't see in Saudi as much. In that the Saudis would would have a certain different look towards you if you yeah, were let's a pounder. Mm, well, maybe not. But uh, I guess it all depends on the person. But we're I mean this is really a generalization. Um, in the center of Saudi, they may be a little bit more closed because of the geographical, you know, um, area. But if you go into the east or the west of Saudi, they're more open, as I think we, we talked about in a few shows, uh, previous shows. Um, but, yeah, uh, I, I guess all I can say about the Qataris in this regards is that they are polite, but uh, they're there to themselves. They just don't want to deal with... Uh, and I heard once that they actually don't like seeing women, uh, like non qatari women, wearing uh, maybe short clothes or, you know, revealing clothes and things like that. It annoys them. <laughs> but I don't think it's because they're, um, they're, they're, you know, they're religious or anything. I think it's, or, or conservative. I think it's just because they can't do that because they're not allowed. Uh-huh. But I thought you said they wore, wore, wore makeup and stuff and didn't have to. Yeah, they can wear makeup and everything, but they have to wear, you know, the black so gown thingy. So even though they got the makeup on, they still got the veil and everything? Oh, that's what I'm saying. They have the veil, they cover their hair. Yeah. I see. But like they have, like, full makeup. It's schizophrenic, that's what I'm saying. And and they, they have, like, you know, the really fake lashes. I mean, some of them look really scary. 
<laughs> and again, I don't want to be judgmental, but I'm like, you're beautiful the way you are. You don't need to go overboard. And you can just see they're overcompensating. I, I understand. I understand. They're overcompensating. And and uh, this is the reason why a year for me is more than enough in this country, because it's so fake and um, it's so uh, it's so not spiritual. It's completely the opposite. I mean, even the expats that come here, they're all about the money. They come here just to make the money, um, and everyone is drinking twenty four seven. It's all about consuming and spending. The country is very expensive, really expensive. I mean, our flat is extremely expensive. So um, it just it just totally does not resonate with with me. And uh, that's 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 um, it's, it's really it's, it's 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 sad, you know that um, very well. But it's it's also very um, enlightening because because a lot of people are are. They, they they say no. Why why won't these people wake up? Why don't they want to? Why won't they wake up? Well, when you're nice and being taken care of, there's no point in waking up. Exactly. So there's no uh, let's say there's no incentive to wake up. You know everything is being taken care of. You don't have to worry about rent and paying the electric bill and whether you've got a car or your kids are being educated. None of that's there. And exactly. it's almost like a um, commentary on the human condition that. You know, you don't make these leaps in enlightenment unless you're challenged. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so, and, and this would be an example of it. You've got everything, and yet um, the people who are living amongst you are finding you at least a little boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah, just exactly. are, you know, not living life. You're going through life. Exactly. Exactly. So, and I, and it's just okay. pointless a little bit. No, it's just it feels you can enjoy. I mean, I remember when I went to Nepal and it was my last time there, uh, the last time I was there. And I was quite privileged to meet the uh, Lama uh, that was there. Um, it's a uh, monastery called Kopan Monastery. It's actually quite well known. I think Richard Gere goes there or something. Anyway, I found it by chance. So it became my second spiritual home. And... Um, this this guy he's called Lama Zopa Rinpoche. He um, he's very difficult to meet, and it just worked out. And I met him for an hour, and uh, he gave me some good advice. He's he's really I mean he's a very very wise person. He's over eighty, and um, he told me something that really resonated with me. He said, "It's not about not enjoying life. If you have things." Um, whether it's money or whatever. He said, it's okay to enjoy it. You can indulge and enjoy. He said, it's the attachment that is the problem. And uh, he said, attachment is the root of all suffering, you know, as, as it's said in the Buddhist uh, concept. So it, this is the point. You can enjoy whatever the universe gives you, and everyone has something, because you may not have the money, but you may have something else. Another person that may have the money may not have what you have. You see, it's just, it's like a balance. Everyone has, and, and things change because life is fluid. So we never know how things can change. But it's just about enjoying the moment and not being attached to what you have. And this, I think, is the hardest thing for most humans to, to master, is detaching from the mundane things. Enjoying them, but de- detaching at the same time. So... So this is something they get, I think they get they yeah. get dependent on them. You exactly, know, it becomes an addiction. It, yeah, it, human beings are interesting in that. You know, you get to be like I'm like 68, and when you get to that, be be able to look back and look at life kind of more objectively. That gets the only way exactly. I can. You begin to perceive certain tendencies in human beings that um, are so, somewhat annoying. I guess. And one of those is that they continually want tomorrow to look just like yesterday. Yeah. They feel comfortable in it. It's a known, you know. Then you've got people that they always want to go out and find something new and different. And in the way that we look at human uh, history on the planet, 
it's those people that go out and strive to find something new and different that we remember. Yeah. And the rest of them all become backdrop, backdrops to life. Um, somebody, we got into a conversation about reincarnation and the concept of not everybody could have been Cleopatra. You know? Exactly. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You know, and, this was always uh, my argument. Everyone's saying I'm Cleopatra. I'm a king of I don't know where. Right. You know, but, <laughs> but somebody pointed out that, um, oh, this was Annette, Annette when we were on doing the skeptical Annette, um, Sassy. Oh, Annette. I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard yeah, that show. It, yeah, she's great. And, she uh, is. but she was, she was, um, you know, the question being is that, so if there's reincarnation, how come all, all you seem, everybody that remembers anything is these <clears throat> big lifetimes? <clears throat> and it was pointed out that it's conceivable that the people around these big people, you know, who have nothing in their lives to begin with, fixate yeah. so much on that personality, that critical personality in history, that that's their focus, that's their memory. Because they didn't even know themselves, they weren't even acknowledging themselves. That's why we have all these superstars and, you know, the people get invested in these storylines of people that they don't even know. Exactly. You know? Very and, true and sad. And very sad because every yeah. single human being is unique and special. You know, and if, exactly. if, it's one thing if you go through life and you're unique and special and very few people realize it or reinforce it. It's another thing when you go through life and you don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I never understood, uh, the people, I mean, people who fixate on other people, whether it's people they know in their circle or it's celebrities or well-known people. You have enough going on in your life. Focus on your life. Focus on getting yourself together because it's not easy, um, especially when you come from a dysfunctional family, which I think, unfortunately, most people come from dysfunctional p families, especially nowadays how, how the society has uh, has become. It's very difficult to, I mean, you know, you know what I mean. It's, it's difficult. You, you, you always find yourself growing up realizing that there is something that's been uh, well, they, they, not okay. They, they took the uh, the children and they made them commodities, just like everything else. Exactly, exactly. So, no. so the but that in itself, when you grow up and become an adult, is a challenge, and can uh, d um, can disable you from having a stable and balanced life. So that in itself takes time to sort out and fix, and you know, you you just put yourself together. So if you put your focus on other people, how can you focus on yourself? This is what I always uh, this is what I always wondered. So um, when you see all these, let's say, these tabloids and people saying, "Oh, did you hear this celebrity and that celebrity? They they um, uh, broke up." Or or for example, this last thing that I I, I saw by chance about Alicia Keys uh, deciding not to put any makeup on and. Uh, out of curiosity, sometimes I like reading the comments of people just, just from a psychological point of view because I'm, you know, as a psychology student, I like to just see what people think. And, uh, I'm, I'm always horrified from the comments that, uh, there's a lot of negativity, you know, and there was this one girl, she said to other, to other women who were saying, well, well good for her, but I mean, this isn't a big deal. Okay, so uh, I don't, and what, more than one lady was saying, uh, I don't, I don't put makeup on either. It's been 30 years. So this this girl says, well, she's a celebrity. Um, no one cares about uh, housewives. You get what I'm saying? I know, and that's what's so. I'm like, wow. Yeah, exactly. So you know, that, these reality, this, this reality TV stuff where. You've got famous people, yes, but they're just living their lives, you know. The reality yeah. is that you could take television cameras into anybody's home and you would have just as much compelling drama. True. It doesn't need to be a famous person. Exactly. You know? And if people if people just paid attention to the fact that, look, at every single thought that you make goes into the collective, therefore affecting the collective. If you realize that your reality is your own doing, you've made contracts and agreed to certain things, 
And yes, you take responsibility. It's your reality. You created it. Exactly. If people went into a state of um, looking at themselves, appreciating themselves, they automatically have to look at other people in the same way. And I, I tell you, I was not a fan of humanity. <laughs> well, I can't blame you. They were pretty screwed up. But as I opened myself up to look at humanity as each individual, as an opportunity to, um, let's say, persuade them that there is more to life, okay, yeah. and began to just allow myself to connect in ways that I had prevented because they kind of like, they'll suck you, get vampire, vampire, energy vampires, they suck your energy right out of you, you know? True. But the more I started interacting with people, the more fascinated I got with each individual story. And then when I got into the radio and stuff, I, I started realizing that everybody's got a story, and every story, for whatever reason, is fascinating in some aspect. True. And so I started talking to more and more people, and that's the key is that I started appreciating myself and be feeling i you know i've got to I've got to go out there this is these are people that you know if they just are given the chance to feel a different type of energy, not even talking to them, just I believe in the energy universe, and if my energy is what I believe it is, then I should go out and I should try to allow people to feel a different type of energy. Exactly. But everybody's like true. that. So when you go out into public, you're also going to get those idiots, those awful people that are just putting out such vile energy. All right? Now, the yeah. key to it is is that if they're doing that to you and you re begin to resonate with that, then you are putting out that energy. So, and I used to be one of those. I mean, if you tweaked me off, I was going to respond in a, in a very negative way. Mm -hmm. But then as I learned, I realized that even though those people are in a negative state, they do not have to remain in a negative state. All you have to do is get by what they're saying and doing and see it as an, a piece of, a, a, a violin that's out of tune and tune it. True. And then it's their choice whether they want to actually resonate with it or not. Well, in, in effect, they will not have a, they can't, they, at that moment, they have no other, uh, other reaction except to resonate or leave. Yeah, exactly. Because a, a person who is knowingly putting out positive, loving, joyful energy is always going to overcome the dark side. There's no other true. way because nature wants to vibrate with that loving, joyful person. So when that person is, is vibrating at that, everything around them, whether anybody senses it or not, the trees, the birds, the bees, they're all starting to vibrate along with that person. That's how powerful we are. Absolutely. I so, you know, at the, at the instant that they're in confront, confronting the energy field, they, they will either, you know, all of a sudden go, what was, what was I thinking? What was the problem? Or they will leave. And whether they stay or not is not that 3D personality's decision because they were being drawn into that. There's no coincidence. They were True. being drawn into that situation with you in order to make that connection of energy. That's very true. You know, so if I don't go out there and put myself out as one of these energy beacons, then I'm not doing my job. You know, and, and it's yeah. an opportunity to make a change energetically. So, I th and once you do that, once you really appreciate that everybody's got a story, everybody's as important to everybody else, we all come into the game with the same thing, and that's thought, consciousness. Very true. You know? I the couldn't agree more. With it, the more it, it begins to, to build a reality around you that is, uh, is to your, more to your liking. Because now you've realized I'm not, I'm not being, my reality doesn't depend on the, on the banks or the politics or the fact that I'm married to this guy or I've got this daughter. None of that is, is important. What's important is me and how I'm perceiving life and how I want to perceive life. And once you take that, that concept of dominion over yourself, you got nobody to blame. 
And that's exactly. the key. If you have nobody to blame, then get on with it. Exactly. That's so true. That, and I, I, you made a, such a valid point because it's all about taking responsibility. Taking your own response. And I think, um, people are so afraid to, I mean, I was one of those people out of ignorance because when I finally realized, I mean, you know, the, 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 the light bulb, uh, switched on in my head and I'm like, oh, wait a second, but I'm responsible. I got it. Then I wasn't trying to run away from it. I didn't say, oh, no, 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 that's not the case. That's not, no, I said, okay. So now that I get it, I have the responsibility to work on this. And, uh, and that's the key, as you said, is to realize that you have self-responsibility and that you shouldn't blame anyone because things happen. Crappy circumstances happen. There's a reason for them. But as you said, it all depends on how we resonate, how we behave towards these situations. And if we decide to, 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 to react in a negative way, in, I mean, at the end of the day, we still should not blame others because we're the ones who reacted. So it's a very hard concept to understand um, because it really, really puts responsibility square on your lap. And I guess it's a, it's a difficult thing for, for, for people to want to accept because it's easier to blame. You know, it's, it's easy, easy to play the victim, the victim. Exactly. But the thing of it is, is that if you're playing that game, you have no freedom. You don't exactly. know who you are. And I remember my, my friend Cindy, when she first got here, she put it this way. She says, I don't know where home base is. And we've had good discussions about, you know, people not really feeling like they were home. Whereas, to me, wherever I'm at is home. Home there's, is where the heart is. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing around me that, you know, says this is home. It's yeah. where I am. And well, where the pets are too. I mean, but that's, <laughs> not, that's extensions of me. But, um, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I was lucky. I came from a very, um, unique, the, the old, oldest of ten kids. Um, environment and really learned what works in the sand pit. In the sand pit, I, I mean the sandbox, but we had a sand pit. We actually had a place wow. very close that we used to play in that where they would dig up sand. For whatever reason, there was a huge sand pit there. Uh, but that's where we learned, you know, what works between children. And it's very interesting to, to go back and think about the dynamics of that because each of each of those children were bringing in their what they were seeing at home to that sandbox but when you got into the sandbox you had to deal with a set of laws and regulations that really were much more clear than what your parents and everything else was in schools and what all that was trying to tell you because in the sandbox what works is are you having fun exactly you know, that's the only point of the sandbox. Are you having fun? And if you're not having fun, everybody leaves the sandbox, except yeah. the person that was having fun. So you either play and have fun, or, you know, you're going to bring in your garbage and you're going to try to take my shovel because it's my shovel and you want my shovel. That ain't going to work. Yeah. You know, and the basics of the, of the, Let's say the, the, the game in the sandbox is just, we gotta have fun here. And if you're not having fun, then you better leave. Exactly. <laughs> so I just, That's learned, so true. I took that. I mean, I say on the, on any show I'm on, if we're not having fun, we're doing something wrong. Exactly. You know, because I learned in the sandbox, the point of life is to have fun. Fun, exactly. That's, so, it's, it's very um, disturbing when, I mean, there's, obviously a reason for it but the whole purpose as you very well said is to have fun it's a game it's it, from the way i see it is that source is um and as many other people have expressed it but i really truly believe in this source is expressing itself through us it's learning through us Opposite of what they tell you, that, you know, God is all-knowing. Yeah, God is all-knowing. Fine, that's not, that's not the point. The point is that it, it's, it's all about, it's like a game. It's all about exploring and creativity. So it should be fun. But for some reason, somewhere along the line, something happened. 
and uh, it, let, me, it, let, me, let me let me just point this out. I, sure, because I, I think I think you'll you agree with this analogy or whatever. You know, sure. we to say that God is all knowing. But I'm sorry, if there's never been a question or a thought out there, then God is not all-knowing. So to be all-knowing, you enact a universe that keeps learning. That's my point as well. That's, that's but what it goes I'm totally the opposite. Yeah. It goes yeah. totally the opposite of what any religion says. Exactly. Without, I mean, I think that, that God was in a position, I call it source God, because I believe there's also creator gods like God. Yes. But so, so, so the source God is there, and is yeah, technically all-knowing. But bored, <laughs> you exactly. Know? So you, and, and, and being all powerful, <laughs> every thought that God had creates. It's a creation, right? But the creation is out of boredom and the need to learn more. So yes, every single thing that we do, God knows about. So as we learn, God is still all knowing and maintains that position. But if we weren't here to continue to learn and to continue to experience all sorts of really weird stuff then God would be bored. So the purpose exactly. of life is to have fun for God. Exactly. True, true. I, I totally agree with that. I never really said it to anyone because, you know, they think I'm crazy. But uh, that's kind of what I've always felt. That, But wouldn't it be boring to know everything? That's really what I always thought, even since I was younger. It's like it's so boring to know everything. There, there's no, there's no innovation. There's no surprise. There's no, um, it's, it's just, yeah. So it makes more sense that we are the expression of source and even all the, uh, other, uh, let's say creators like, like, uh, Gaia or whoever else, they're all an expression of source. And, uh, it's, it's, it should be a game. It should be fun. But, I guess uh, we uh, disconnected, and uh, we're, we're taking things too seriously. Well, another example of that is how people want to live forever. Why would you want to do that? That's eventually going to get boring. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Well, um, some people say it's because you know time changes, and you can see the changes of time and all that stuff. Yeah, but it, you're still living in the same 3D reality. You know, you want to experience other planes. But I think people who want to live forever are people who don't understand that there is much more beyond. They're, they're so afraid to let go of what they know and, you know, the comfortable, uh, the, just the comforts of their, of, of their surroundings that they're too afraid to experience anything beyond. You know, is what, what they're doing is they're taking a book and they're reading it and then they're rereading it and they're rereading it and they're rereading it. They don't want to pick up another book. True. True. <laughs> No, yeah, I agree. I, I so agree. You see, we, when we talk about things like this, and then I come back, and you know, we we hang up, and I just sit down, and you know, like for instance, a country like Qatar or or Saudi, it, these concepts are so foreign. And uh, when you see that a whole collective does not even realize how immense the universe and creation is, and everyone is so living in their box or in this kind of dogma um, you can't even blame them to not to, to be afraid of death you know they do want to live forever because they're you comfortable know? with it they're comfortable exactly they're comfortable with it um, you know my mother was like what was she 86 or something when she passed and one of my one of my brothers said to me that mom said I thought there'd be more time and I'm going like you had 86 friggin' years. What, what, you didn't have enough time to do what? <laughs> you know? You sat on your ass for the last 20 years, you know, and then you raised kids. I mean, she, it was, it was like preposterous to me because she was one of the most intelligent, educated people I had ever met. And she was a mother, you know, and then yeah. she really, when my dad got into um, financial problems with his business, she actually forced him to let her go out and be a, a nurse. She was she was nurse trained. Went back to school, got some you know upgrades, and then became a nurse. And um, you know she had just a marvelous. I mean, she did all sorts of things. But what did you what 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 did you run out of time? What were you going to do? What you know? It was like yeah. Now you've got an opportunity. And it was funny because after she passed, I'll tell people this. 
um, when you're in a shower, the ionization, the water the, gets into a negative ionization concept. Um, you, it, for some reason, it sort of opens up the etheric a little bit. So you can um, connect with people that are operating in faster than light speeds, what we, you guys would call death. <laughs> I call mm-hmm. it faster than light speed. They're, they're moving, you can communicate more. So mom was showing up every time I took a shower. Mom was showing up and um, acknowledging that she should have, because I tried to talk to her about a, a lot of things. Um, one being reincarnation, because of course it went completely against the Catholic religion. But my nephew, who um, was very close to mom, she was babysitting for him a lot. He believed in reincarnation. And one day he said, well, grandma does too. And I said, she does? Oh, yeah. And it was a known thing to him. So she would talk to him about metaphysical things, maybe this kid, you know, um, who was also extremely brilliant. Um, but she didn't want to get into that kind of sharing with me or her child, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they, even when they start to open up, it's it, there. It, the, the pathways they may take are, are, are kind of like much different than what we would take, which is to sit down on a radio show and talk about this stuff. Yeah. You know, so they keep it all in their heads. And so you kind of wonder, okay, you got all these people out there all over the world who seem to be brain dead by our standards. Maybe they're not. Maybe they just are not relating this to us. And, you know, it's it's like there's an old saying that the older I get, the more the smarter my parents get. But I think that may be true with um, conspiracy people. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the first, your first, you know, meeting with somebody that thinks that 9-11 was an inside job, you want to either haul off and hit them or run as fast as you can away from them. But when more and more evidence is being built that that is, in fact, the way it happened, it was an inside job, um, then the conspiracy people go from conspiracy into truthers. Mm-hmm. And that was very well um, put out with, you know, like the the last X file. Yeah. Uh, you know, the initial opening of that, Mulder is realizing that he's been bamboozled and that there are no ETs, there is no threat from outer space. It's all this matrix of control. Yeah. And then he meets some people from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Poor but, guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, let's let's talk about the Ramadan um, sure. concept because, again, when I was um, the last job that you know, uh, 3D kind of job, we had, we had a, a sister kind of business right next door, and the man that was sort of the office man, my my comp, you know, he was doing the same job I was, but for them, we would interface a lot, and we became friends over the years. And he was Muslim, and he was, without a doubt in my mind, without a doubt, he imbued purity and love like no mm-hmm. other human being I have ever met. There was something so fundamentally pure about him. He was, his, his wife was lovely, his children, I mean, he was so absolutely focused on them. That he, he was, he, everything about his life was dedicated to his family and his spirituality. Because in his case, I did not hear it as a religion. I heard it as spirituality. And every year he goes through this fasting thing. Yeah. And it just befuddled me because I'm going like, first off, I don't know how you're handling it. Because I would watch him lose this immense amount of weight every year. Yeah. In a matter of weeks. So, uh, can you please try to, you know, explain to me what what this is all about? Would you like me first to elaborate about how it works, or what is the concept of Ramadan? Whichever you feel comfortable with. Okay, so the daily life, how how it starts, practically from dawn, uh, when the sun rises until the sun sets, uh, you fast. So no water, no food, no medication, nothing should go through your, you know, 
your throat or whatever. You, you can't swallow anything. Not even you can't even have cigarettes. Nothing. And how, um, how long is this? Is it a month? Is it 30 days? It's a month. Yeah, it's 30 days. And of course, it depends where you're living because, you know, like uh, in Canada, let's say, or in Northern Europe, uh, the sun sets really late. So if the sun sets at 9 or 10 p.m., you fast until that time. So some people are going to fast only for, let's say, I don't know, 10 hours. Other people are going to fast for 14, 16 hours. Okay, so that's that's one thing. Um, and then when the sun sets, that's when you break your fast, your fasting, and you uh, and you have you know um, everyone's different. Some people, uh, you know, do it the traditional way where they have uh, dates and um, they eat a couple of dates and then they go pray and then they eat after that. Uh, some people eat right away. It's just it depends on every person. And you know there. Are, these traditional dishes that people have. Every country has their own traditional dishes. It's usually, you know, you break your fast with soup or things, like very light things. And uh, in the evening, around um, like three out, two, three hours after sunset, uh, you have a prayer that uh, is like two hours long. And you go to the mosque and every day you, uh, you, you, you know, you pray and you hear the... Uh, the mu'adhin or the the person who uh, who reads the Quran out loud and pray you know uh, get, guides the prayer um, he reads a section of the Quran and they have to finish the section of the Quran they have they have to finish all the Quran within a month uh, the last ten days this so is just excuse, to give excuse me so they actually sure. read the entire Quran Quran um, during that thirty days yes they and read the entire so these so these prayer things in the in the mosque have to be at least an hour or two hours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because you daily. know there is. Hmm, sorry. Daily. Daily, yes, daily. Of course, not everyone goes, but if you're going to, you know, practice Ramadan the way it should be practiced, you do that. You go, at, like or let's say let's say um, the sun sets around six six thirty. Uh, the prayer starts around eight thirty or so. And um, and you just stay there for a couple of hours or an hour and a half, depending. Every mosque is different, but they have a schedule to finish the Quran uh, till the last day of, of of Ramadan. So they they divide it. The last ten days of Ramadan, uh, you have those two hours in the evening, and then you have something else called the prayer of the standing prayer, if I want to translate it literally, where you have Another two hours, um, from one to three in the morning, because in Islam, as I believe it's also in other spiritual concepts where, um, they say that the energies are very, uh, are very less 3D in that time. So you're closer to the spiritual etheric realm, and, uh, that's the best time to pray. Okay, now let me, let me just go over this again because sure. you've got these people that are not eating for, you know, up to 14 hours in the day. And then you make them go and do a two-hour thing at the mosque where they're learning, they're hearing the Quran being read. Yeah. And then as you go, you've done this for 20 days, so now your body is pretty beat up. <laughs> Quite. And, and, and they're making you do this extra thing where... What's happening? Yeah, practically uh, the last ten days, because the 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 whole concept of Ramadan is that it's said that it's the month where uh, the Prophet Muhammad received his teachings of the Quran from uh, uh, from Gabriel. So in the last ten days, these they are not sure when was the specific night that the Prophet first met Gabriel. So that's a very sacred holy night. They don't know. It's between the 20th or the 21st till the 30th, I think, or 29th. It's about 10 days. So uh, in these last 10 days, they do this extra prayer at night. I mean, in the morning, which is from 1 to 3 approximately. And that's when they read more of the Quran. So the last 10 days, they do two parts. Yeah, it's crazy. It it should be a month of complete spiritual practice. 
devoting yourself to spiritual practice. Well, I and of course, if you work, you work, you do your job, and then you go home. You rest a couple of hours before you know the the, the sun sets. You eat, and then you have to. You should focus on uh, the, the the spiritual or the religious practice. Well, oddly enough, it sounds to me like, um, in a sense, a vision quest kind of concept of the Native Americans, where anybody that is is sleep deprived, okay, mm-hmm. um, their entire within 48 hours of not getting correct REM sleep, which you would not get if you're getting up at one o'clock in the morning, yeah, um, you you have the first stages of diabetes. Ugh. All right, now that's how fast it works. Um, but also, you can, they, they put people, and these were young kids, these were, you know, 20 year olds. They put them through a situation where they said, okay, take these tests, and they took these tests, and then they put them through sleep deprivation in that the kids were laying down and going to sleep, but every time that they would get to a REM signal, they were on a, they'd wake know, them up. They'd wake them up with a sound. Just <sighs> enough to take them out of the REM. And then they would, would, they started redoing these testing. And these, the, the entire testing went downhill, downhill, downhill. And if you don't get enough of it, you begin to hallucinate. You exactly. begin to hear things and stuff. So it's like this entire culture is designed a month where they are absolutely, in my mind, putting people into a stress situation to open them up, um, psychically. Yeah. Okay. Be in, 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 in a time between one and three in the morning, which is, I mean, that's why so many of us that are not on a schedule end up being up until three in the morning. True. Because there is something magical and mystical and, um, you're, you're free to be intuitive and to, you know, that's why the Native Americans also say sleep on it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, take, take it through those, that, that quiet time. Yeah. Where you're processing, even if you're asleep. So um, I find it absolutely fascinating. It is, and and the people who do uh, practice it, let's say the people of the older generations, uh, or even the younger people who are still very devoted, uh, you hear many of them do have visions. Like I heard a few stories where I would I was told that they would see light uh, from the horizon, not the sun. It was night, and they would see white light from the horizon. And I don't know, coming from the sky or something like that, and uh, they believed that uh, they did, they witnessed that holy night, um, which could be true. I mean, I, again, I, for me, I never dismiss any spiritual experience. I respect all spiritual experiences uh, because I've had my own. So you know, when you do experience your own, you tend to believe other people. But um, there's definitely something to it. Uh, where how it's scheduled, as you said, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, and definitely fasting, uh, being deprived of sleep or eating uh, does make you lightheaded, and uh, it can make you more susceptible to things that uh, if you're heavier, you don't, you're more, you know, you're more solid in the 3D. You don't, you don't really feel it or notice it. I mean, I notice myself when I don't eat, um, I feel lighter. I remember, I'll never forget once, I was walking up the stairs and I practically felt like I was flying. It l- really felt like my body had no weight. And it was because I haven't eaten in a really long time. Well, watching him go through, um, Amy, watching him go through this every year for, what, 15 years or something. Mm-hmm. I can honestly say that something happened energetically to him during the Ramadan. That it was like... Yes, I could see his physical body shrinking, you know, but the light body was much more intense. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But obviously, he was practicing it the right way. His heart was in the right place because it's. If we think about it, it's really not about labels, you know, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, whatever. It, it's not about people put labels, but. I always say it doesn't matter how you practice your spiritual. Uh, you know, beliefs, or how in the sense that if you do it in a specific way or in another way, it's how your heart is in it. Well, you when know, I wanted, what I'm saying? Yeah, when did Ramadan start here now? Uh, it started on the 6th of June. Okay, so we're only about 10 days into it. Yeah. Then. All right. 
Um, because you've got, a, 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 I don't even know, is what, is it a third of the population is Muslim in the world? I it's think very so. high. Yeah, it is and, quite high. You know, and you've got them all going through a process of, that seems to me to be very, um, let's say, contrived, mm-hmm. whether they understood it or not when they set this up as being something that they thought they should do. But you've exactly. got a third of the population of the planet that is opening them up themselves up to connecting to them their higher selves in whatever form they may be envisioning it or maybe not envisioning it just putting themselves physically into that state at a 3D level i mean if people are talking about changes in frequency to me we should be paying a lot more attention to what's happening because True, it would be good if you, if you want to program the world do it while they're all open like this yeah so I exactly. suggest that we, you know, if, if, if you want to assume that I'm correct here, <laughs> that mm-hmm. your thoughts are that important, you know, really focus in on these people who are opened up and just open up your frequencies of love and joy and enlightenment and understanding and protect them. True. That's beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm just getting this concept. I mean, this is, this to me is really enormous because We've all been talking about the change of energy. What's happening? Here? Well, maybe it's humanity is happening. It is. It is. Yeah. I'm seeing some Muslims speaking concepts that uh, sh- shock me, like things that are very open. We More can dump. We can dump. We, you know, never mind protect them. We can dump in a whole concept of, you know, the collected the collective concept of we're all in this together. We exactly. need no more sacrificing, and nobody gets left behind. Just open exactly. yourself up to truth, pure, unadulterated truth. Because if they're, if they're making themselves open vessels, then, yes, we're going to go protect them, but we're also going to open up what we know to be true. Very true. I totally agree. Hey, listen, we're at the top we, of the yeah. hour here. Let's take a break. Um, sure. Miss Colleen's probably got some little tune that she can put on for us. And um, well, I just love talking to you, Nora. Me too, Nancy. Me too. I'm enjoying this so much. Maybe we'll let Colleen say something in the next hour. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love her to join in. She's chatting and taking care of the station, you know. I, I'd good. love to have her come in too, but um, I'm afraid yeah, she to can. ask her. Well, I have music ready. Good girl. This is Stronger Woman by Jewel. Alrighty, and we are back. Yes, we are. And um, thank you for listening to Wolf Spirit Radio and Haggy Shack Radio, which are both listener-supported stations. So we need your donations. It's a way of giving your energy into what happens here. It's all for the station's um Operations. None of us get paid for this, uh, except in gratitude that we can influence the collective consciousness by having these scheduled discussions of whatever comes up. So, um, Nora, is there, Colleen, first off, is there anything you would like to contribute as far as, you know, what we've been talking about? Um, no, I'm sorry, not at the moment. <laughs> I'm here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh, we just want to hear your beautiful voice. I know, and it wouldn't happen without her. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Cat thought he wanted to type something. <laughs> one day, one day, I it was a break, and I I came back, and the cat's laying on the on the uh, keyboard. And don't you know that it locked itself up because it kept getting these messages and finally it had a brain fart and went dead and locked up everything so I couldn't use any of the keys. And I couldn't talk to anybody because I didn't have any keys. All I had was a mouse. So when they came on, I could tell them, help, I, I can't, <laughs> you know. And, um, you know, so I've, since then I've been very careful to make sure the keyboard is pushed in, but I had sat back down. I didn't expect them to come flying. From yeah, but I don't know what, what what's the deal with cats and keyboards. I just don't get it. Um, I'll tell you one thing. He um, continually is the I heat. Would, 
Well, I don't know. The I, it's weird. Like he used to get on top of the the. I've got a laptop computer that operates, you know, and he would get on top of it. I was finding him all the time being on top of the computer, and you know, I'm going like, what is it that you you know? It's like this obsession with you. Yeah. And the computer had all this shungite um, oh. stickers on. It. And when I got a shungite on him, a collar that we, that Colleen made actually, the cats, um, that yeah. has a, a, an S4 shungite on it, he never went to the computer again. Aww. So in this case, it very much might have been the fact that it had so much shungite, because cats Aww. will be attracted to it. So. That's so sweet. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. So Nora, um, what would you like to talk about? Um, well, I thought maybe we can just, uh, end the discussion about Ramadan because, um, uh, yes. I, I just wanted to point out something that maybe, um, you know, people who don't see, uh, how it really is on a daily basis with a lot of people, how R- Ramadan is reduced to, um, it has become really commercial. Um, people are uh, practically, even if they do fast during the day, um, they uh, stuff their faces at night. So a lot of people actually gain weight in Ramadan. Plus, uh, there are all these series that are only dedicated to Ramadan, Arabic series, and uh, some of them are actually really not appropriate for Ramadan. Are you talking <laughs> like, about TV series? Yeah, TV series, TV series. And... Uh, uh, just things that are really, some things are just really inappropriate. And, uh, I don't know if this is, I mean, I, I don't find this really normal because, you see, this is the schizophrenia I was talking about, that people are always talking about religion and they're always kind, they have this whole, like, holier, holier than thou attitude, but then they accept these things, you know? And people are hooked on these TV series. Even the people I know, you know, Ramadan is the month of the TV series. Everybody's watching TV series. And there are a lot. There are like at least 15 TV series. So you, even if you want to, I mean, there are people who pick two, three to follow every day. So you have three hours of TV. And what, so, what's the storyline in these things? I mean, at least over here, you have, different... you know, something about Jesus on Easter is a movie. Huh. Well, they do, for example, maybe there would be one that has to do with, uh, you know, the stories of, of course, they don't, they no, never portray the prophet because it's not allowed, but, um, which is something I never got, but anyway, um, <clears throat> it, they would have maybe one series about something, you know, religious, but it's never really, you know, people never really focus on that. There are things that have to do with violence, like stories about violence and domestic violence. Uh, you have stuff that, uh, I'll never forget, uh, there was this Egyptian series that they would, you know, there was the, the story of this guy who was married to four women, and you know, the fighting between the women, the jealousy and all this petty kind of stuff. And uh, there would also be like inappropriate stuff, things that have to do with, uh, you know, people in casinos and 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 like these dancers and prostitution and drinking and like clubs and like, uh, I'm just like, wow. And and it's accepted. And you even hear swear words. Well, you know, this, this, being a conspiracy person, Mm -hmm. this, this could be a way of keeping people from getting to that alter state. You know, well, if, if, if you're if you're feeding them this information, then you're you're three D and and bringing them down back into a mundane and um, not spiritual position. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They may be very afraid of Ramadan. Could be what the population could become at that point. Especially now with all this energy that's been. Uh um the the collective uh, how it's waking up uh could be could very well be that this has been going on because it's been going on for a long time it's been over 30 years that this is how it is i switch off on ramadan i totally switch off like mentally i don't relate and uh i just don't want to relate and i say it openly i can't stand this month i say it openly and, and this is really how i feel not because of the concept behind it as i said every every religion 
<clears throat> initially has uh, something very good to offer. Initially. Then things get twisted. But uh, the way it is portrayed, I just switch off. You know, I just, um, because I do my own spiritual practices. I don't need a month to make me feel that way. Just like when they say, I don't know, Mother's Day. Well, you should celebrate your mother every day. Uh, Valentine's Day. You should celebrate love every day with everyone. You know, th- there shouldn't be a, a dedicated month or day for remembering something, let's say. Um, so. Yeah, but you gotta schedule these things. Cause that's yeah, of course. I, I understand. People don't remember them. That's true. I that's agree. true. Yeah, but I, I totally agree. It's good that it's done, but, uh, this shows you that people have to be reminded and reminded. If we teach our kids from a young age all these concepts, they wouldn't need the reminders. They would, this would be their life. This would be their reality. That's a different story, I guess. Um, but yeah, this is all I have to say about Ramadan. It's a very interesting month. Um, <laughs> I, I just find it funny. Just the way, and again, I don't want to sound judgmental. I'm really trying not to be judgmental, but it just, angers me a little bit that uh, people are, they always, a lot of people have this holier than thou attitude, but then they don't see their own actions. So we go back to what we said at the beginning that everyone should focus on them, themselves. Well, we, we have the same situation over here regarding Christmas. Yeah. Um, I, I flat out tell people stop playing Christmas because if you play Christmas every year, all you're doing is bolstering up the economy. If the exactly. economy doesn't get their influx of Christmas crapola, then it's going to crumble because the 50% of most small businesses get their money during the Christmas season. So it's why insane. would I, huh? It's insane. Yeah. The amount of Money, people get into debt to just bring gifts. <laughs> Which is about what I was going to point out is that oh. it, 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 it's, it's part of it is control over you because you, you're always in debt because of what you did in Christmas. But the only thing you did was bolster the economy and put yourself in debt. If you want to free yourself from an economic system that is absolutely deranged, yes, it'll come down, but it, when it, it will not stay down. You know, I mean, people get so afraid of oh, taking the economy apart, you know. Well, yeah. the economy that's that's working by keeping you enslaved, financially enslaved, is not an economy that you should be happy with. Indeed. And trust, you know, you have to trust that, that human beings in their basic nature just want to be, you know, happy, <laughs> have exactly. fun. And True. So if you take this down, and you could take it down by simply not... Buying gifts. Exactly. If you don't do that, it'll come down back really rapidly. But of exactly. course, everybody is under such pressure of doing this. I mean, I when I first decided I wasn't going to play the game anymore, and I told my sisters, I said, "No more gifts. I'm not going to do more gifting because it's only feeding the economy." I didn't say it to them, mm-hmm. you know. But um, they, the only one was like, "Really?" Because I used to give her really neat gifts. The rest of them were like, oh, okay, good, you know. And then um, when I did the same thing with my friends, well, most of them were like, well, that's interesting, you know. And But they understood exactly, you know, it's not just the fact that it's, um, you know, you're spending your money to get yourself in debt for what purpose. It's the concept of I give all year round. Now, I know people that buy gifts and hold them until Christmas. What's the point of that? The person might be dead by then. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. It's like if somebody needs help, I give it to them. You know? But yeah, it, feel, it, fe- they f- it feels like they're compelled to show that, you see, this is not the spirit of any, uh, uh-huh. of, of giving. No, it is not. If you feel compelled, yeah, if you feel compelled to give, then that's, the, the energy behind it is lost. It's, it's the opposite. You want to give because you want to give, not because you feel that, oh, I am under pressure that on this day I have to give gifts or else, you know, people are going to think I'm this or that or I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not in a Christmassy spirit or it, it, it's just, it's so obvious, but it seems like it's so difficult to, to understand for most people. And, uh, well, you know, I mean, if you look at the, just the, the stuff that goes around Christmas, um, Santa Claus has got nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. 
you know. Gift giving, nothing really to do with Jesus, except you give from the heart. And unless you're, you're, you know, the, the, the nobles and you got the myth, the, the incense and the Frankenstein and whatever else they gave, you know, but that's acknowledging a special gift from the source God to us, you know, an avatar that could tell, teach us, could show us, you know, what we're capable of becoming. Exactly. And, you know, so the, the, the concept of, um, Christmas, is so linked, if you look at it, the different, like, Santa Claus was a Coca-Cola scheme. It was yeah. an advertising thing. You know, <laughs> uh, the Christmas cards, all of it, it was designed to feed the economy. Exactly. And so where's the spirituality there? They, they absolutely, <clears throat> I stopped going up to Massachusetts at Christmas time where all my family was because I realized that those are not the people that I see in the summertime. At Christmas time, they're stressed out, they look terrible, they feel terrible, and they're all under stress for the holidays to do it right, you know? And it's yeah. like, I don't think Jesus put that on the table as being a requirement to be saved. <laughs> exactly. To go into debt every single year. But what's the point? As you said before, the sandbox concept. It's about yeah. having fun, being around people you love. What's the point of being stressed or fighting? You know, because I think a lot of fights break out in holidays. Oh. Yeah. Oh. All the crap comes out. Um, Somebody always gets physically sick. You see? So it, it, what's the point? Absolutely. And this, I think, is a global and thing. And a lot of people it's die. Everywhere. Oh, my goodness. It's a terrible time. <laughs> Actually, it, it's funny you, you, you bring that out because you point that out because in, in, after Ramadan, we have the Eid period, you know, the, um, where people start, you know, they, they go back to the normal, uh, life and they have the, you know, this special kind of, um, holiday or whatever they call it after Ramadan. Do you believe that so many people fall ill and die in this period? I myself know people who've been either sick, like really sick, had to go to the hospital and get operations, or people who have died. The amount of people who die in this period is amazing, and I don't, under, I've never understood it. And now that you say that, that's quite interesting. The coincidence, obviously, it's not a coincidence, but uh, yeah. Well, it, it, over over here, it's um, a lot of it has to do with just the stress, because it's, even if you're not stressed, all the stress energy is going around. Um, there, they physically have damaged the body. You know, they, you know, Survivor, the, the show Survivor. Uh huh. They had this one guy and he was like, I think, I think he was 72. I think that's what his age was. And he won one of the, um, rewards. And so they went to, uh, this feast thing and he had to be taken out because his body simply could not tolerate the food that he ate. Oh my goodness. Yeah, he was, wow. but you know, um, so yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't take people and just put them through this and then, you know, they just start up again. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's it very, time. it's a physically very dangerous, um, yearly event as far as yeah. I would. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So I guess that's it about Ramadan. We'll see how things go. <laughs> Well, God bless but, us. Like uh, I say, the concept of being, you know, having a whole large group of people oh, yeah. to open themselves up to um, physically going through, uh, you know, of course, we wouldn't recommend it. There's so many other ways of doing it. Um, but to be dangerous, actually, psychically. Yeah, a, danger, a dangerous thing, but uh, it's, it's just really overwhelming when you think about it. And the fact that they're, that you've got all of this uh, commercialization to keep them from going there in their own heads... That may be an indication that they're afraid that if if the people really did connect, oh my gosh, their reality would shift in a second. Exactly. Very true. Very true. Now, it's dangerous because <clears throat> people also maybe are not 100% ready because their reality would shatter or their belief system would shatter. And um, not everyone is... Um, you know, just like when they say... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when they say, for example, you know, ayahuasca is not for everyone. You know, you, you need to be in a specific, you, you have to have a specific understanding of yourself. You need to be ready for it. So not everyone maybe is ready for that jump yet. 
It's and funny it could, my my mind went to LSD. Okay. It, interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Because I thought, you know, yeah, if if you suddenly put on the light and people saw the magic, it would be like somebody who had taken LSD and was in the, you know, the etheric LSD world. Um, DMT is something that we all produce, but the people that have taken this say that it, you always go back. One guy called it the DMT town because you always go back to the same to place. The same place, yeah. You know? And and you went to to um, what? How do you pronounce that word? Which one? The the hallucinogenic. Oh, uh, ayahuasca. 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 I think that's how it's pronounced. Yeah, no, ayahuasca. you're right. You're right. I just uh, I have some some blocks for certain words, and that's one. Yeah, of, me too. I don't know what it is. Um, but uh, yes, and so, but the thing of it is, is that in all of the stories in the annals and the, let's say the database of people taking hallucinogenics. Nobody really knows what's going to happen when you take it. I mean, the first time taking it, you don't know what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. You cannot be prepared for what's about to happen. They can tell you things, but you either are ready for it or you're not ready for it. And I have heard of very, 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 very few people that, you know, went bonkers because they took uh, hallucinogenic in any form. People survive. Yeah, it's you know, your your entire reality just altered beyond any concept that you can imagine. And when the trip wears off, you're like, wow, oh, that was interesting. It doesn't, mm -hmm. you know. And if and the fact of the matter is that while you're on the trip, you're very comfortable. Yes. You know, there's certain tripping that people get into, but the, unfortunately, the key to, to being on a good trip or a bad trip is what the heck is in your mind. Exactly. If that's what I, that's bad, what I meant. Yeah. If you're looking for bad, that's what you're going to find. That's because when you're at that level of, um, frequency, you're controlling your reality in, in, in ways that, that, that 3D normal people are not doing. Exactly. Because it's just you're you're, deal, you're in the etheric, and the etheric is where all the blueprints come from the, for the 3D. So instead of being in the 3D, having to access you know through your guides normally, um, you know, please, I I, I, w I would like to have this. Um, I would like to have so much fun moving to Italy. You know, mm -hmm. that's something that when you're completely straight, that your guides are going to have to help manipulate because they're working with the etheric. But if you're in, in, in a hallucinatory condition, you are in that etheric and you can manipulate it directly yourself. So that, and that can be terrifying to people that have terrifying images in their heads. That's the and only time I've ever seen anybody go on a bad trip. And that's the thing. Because of how uh, Islam or the way uh, Islam was taught to the generations, these, the generations that are alive today is Fear mongering. Everything is about fear. Um, <clears throat> it, there is no God. To them, God is someone or an, <clears throat> a being that you just need to please. And if you don't do what you are told, then God will be angry. God will be this. God will be that. Blah blah blah. So. They're living in a fear-based... I always ask this question and say, okay, just one question. If uh, stealing or whatever other thing that you shouldn't be doing is allowed, okay, even though it's wrong, would you still do it? For example, you see someone with something you want, but you don't take it because you know you're afraid that God is going to be angry and you're going to be punished for it, let's say. What if we took that out of the equation and God doesn't care? What you're going to do. Let's say there are no consequences. Are you still going to do it? I'm telling you, they pause. They can't answer. Well, my brother one time said that he said, well, I got to tell you, I didn't do it. I did not do a lot of things because Jesus might be watching. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people think like that. I mean, at least he's honest. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's <laughs> you know, he was afraid Jesus would see him do it. You know, um, but again, it's like that was the kid's first thought. Jesus mm -hmm. is watching. If you took that out of the equation, would he then look at it and say, 
Is that going to make me happy if I do that? Exactly. So by having the excuses, oh, I have to do this because my religion says I have to do this. Oh, I have to do this because my dad tells me I have to do this. Good. If you take that out and you say, no, what makes you happy? You know, exactly. do what what you feel good with because if you feel if you feel good, everybody around you feels good. And if exactly. they don't, they connected. leave. They leave. Exactly. But how can a person go on a on a on a trip? Even if it's just self-induced, like, you know, in a spiritual situation, what kind of, uh, reality are they gonna see when everything is about fear and, uh, and, uh, p- putting other, you know, thinking that someone's watching them? It's a paranoid, uh, way of seeing things. So most probably, uh, it's not gonna be a very pleasant experience. That's why I'm saying it could be, um, th- some people maybe are still not ready for it. It because does, of it, the it, it's interesting to me because I think that um, it's only very few people, even if you're afraid, even if you have a lot of fear-based, you know, stuff in your head. It, it there certain. I mean, it's like almost like most people can take it because everything is 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 sort of like disconnected. Um, mm. I don't think the the. It's almost like there's a schizophrenic thing that happens in your head. And the 3D brain, the brain that would say, oh, I don't know about that. That doesn't make, you know, the one that keeps talking to you about every yes. decision and everything, okay? That seems to be shut up pretty much. And you're mm-hmm. just a consciousness that is experiencing a new vision of reality. Yeah. So the people that um, have, get in trouble, and like I say, I, say I, have, I have only been with one person that really unnerved me. Because of their response, mm-hmm. they were they were seeing uh, all sorts of things that you know weren't there, and they weren't there in the etheric, and they weren't there in the 3D. Was um, I, I I didn't know the person enough. That after that, I made very sure that I whoever I was with, I knew, because this was yes. an unknown person, and that you know their reaction was a real downer because. They were so fearful and creating. Yeah, I mean, I know that it was real to them. Yeah. You know, but it wasn't real to us. We're like, uh, uh, no, we're not going there. We're not going there. We don't know where you are, but we're not going there. And yes. um, so that kind of person, I don't really understand. Now, could it be that they were entity controlled? Maybe. And it was something that really? I, at that time, wouldn't have had any concept of. Yes. Yeah, so. there could have been some control. Um, some programming or some kind of control. Maybe. But my experience, my experience with all of that, because we both went to the same place, it would be like flicking on a light or taking a, a hallucinogenic, you know. Um, mm-hmm. To me, most people, 99.9% of the people are going to go through it fine. Turn on the, turn on the lights for crying out loud. Don't be afraid of it. Yes. You know, it's like there's a lot of fear when you're in a black room. You turn on the light. Oh, geez, it's a bedroom. <laughs> exactly. Well, there's nothing but, scary here. No, and there's nothing scary in in allowing yourself to reach the outer rims of what we're capable of, and then going beyond. Exactly. And, and another thing, even if you do see something scary, I, I've had this experience. I don't know if I've ever shared it with you, Nancy, uh, but if you like, I could um, share it with the with, with the listeners. Um, <clears throat> I did have a very scary experience. Um, I got out of my body one of the few times that it happened. Um, you were talking about this yesterday on Cosmic Reality, uh, you and Walt. Uh, it was about, um, was it? Yeah, it was on Cosmic Reality, talking about uh, the unintentional. Um, I don't remember exactly the word you used, but like doing it unintentionally, um, well, un- not controlling un- un- it. Un- yeah, unintentionally um, leaving your body. Exactly. So that's what happened Spont- to me. I think we used the word spontaneously leaving yes. your body. Spontaneously, exactly. So that happened to me, and uh, it was in 2006. <clears throat> and uh, for a long time, I thought I was just, I don't know, it was just uh, imagining. But when I came back, I realized, no, 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 I was there because time just stopped. You know when you just forget where you are, and you're just somewhere else? And I was awake, I was fully awake. I was sitting down, and just, you know when you suddenly, you freeze physically? And you're somewhere else. And I was in a pretty scary place. So, it's being in a scary place 
could be scary. But I think when you remove the fear, nothing can hurt you. I mean, what I saw, I was, I think it was some sort of hell. Because, um, if you like, I can share what I saw. Yeah. Because it was quite, it was, it was quite intense. I found myself in this cave, okay, and it was really dark. And, uh, there was just this red light in the distance. And I looked above me and I saw the ceiling of the cave. It was all rock. And you see the human bodies all intertwined with the rock. And they're all alive. Okay? Many bodies. Just all over. You know, just parts of their bodies are out, parts are in. They're just like integrated into the rocks. Which is a freaky sight, honestly. And they were alive. So I'm like, okay, where the hell am I? <laughs> anyway, I continued walking. I felt like I had the need to continue walking into this, this tunnel. And uh, there was this entrance on the right, on the left side. There was this room in the cave. And I go in and I see this being sitting down behind this uh, very low chair. Uh, not chair, sorry, table. You know, like these tables, the, the Japanese tables? very low ones where they, you know, eat. And uh, he was sitting behind it. And uh, I knew instantaneously, and it could have been something else, but in, in the vision I knew it was the devil. Uh, it could have been something else. So I knew it was waiting for me, or he was waiting for me. So I go and I sit right in front of him. And I start speaking. And I can't really see him. He's more like a shadow. You you can barely see the outlines. And uh, I start telling him, uh, why are you doing this? Um, you're causing suffering. You're causing a lot of suffering. And uh, uh, you can stop this. Uh, God will forgive you. If you stop this, you can go back to the light. You just need to stop this. I don't know why I was saying this. And he was just quiet. And he got up. He walked towards me, stood right in front of me, and he started, excuse my, I mean, it's quite graphic, he started vomiting all these little baby fetuses. And I just looked in horror. I was in shock. And he was laughing, laughing, like mocking me. And the vision ended. So... Now, I was you... totally in the moment. I, there was no fear. So that's scary, but... It's just, yeah, I don't know. You, you, you felt like, I mean, you were, you were sitting at a table or something and all of a sudden you were on this journey that felt very real. Yeah, I was sitting, yeah, I was just sitting down. I had just woken up. It was morning. I had a juice or something I was drinking and I was just sitting down before like starting the day and uh, I was just quiet and my mind, you know when sometimes your mind just switches off? You're, you're, you're kind of switched off for a second. You, you're, you're not thinking. And that's where the magic really happens. Right. It, suddenly, when I woke up, I just realized that I, what just happened. And then I continued my day. I didn't really think about it too much. But in that period, it, my third eye was very open because I, there was a lot going on in that period, um, spiritually. So that was just what, one of the experiences. Did you, what did you take away with you from that? What did you, what was your interpretation? You didn't think about it, but now over no. years, it comes back to you, and do you have anything other than, hmm, interesting? I still can't figure out exactly what that was. I mean, I, I've heard interpretations from different people, but nothing really made sense to me. You know, you don't, you know, when someone tells you something and you feel, mm, no, it doesn't make sense. But I still, there were people that said that, for example, it could be you, you know, that's your darker side. Uh, other people said it was uh, actually your, I don't know, uh, your uh, higher self showing you something. Uh, different things, but it just didn't make sense. So um, I am yet to find out what it meant. Uh, but I definitely went, it was a journey. And now I understand when people say, you know, you get out of your body, I, I understand what it means. Okay, I think that what it was, was a memory that you were seeing... Mm -hmm. As a, as a, uh, it wasn't, it was sort of like a remote viewing in that all of a sudden the memory is calling you back to the exact moment in time where you had a confrontation like that that you interpreted that way. 
but my feeling is is that it was your in this not in this lifetime but it was a un, it was the moment you went oh my god aha it's we call oh. it aha moment yeah when you for the first time in your existence confronted total evil yeah well it's interesting because um it could be linked to something that has to do with um a past uh life that i have um in regards to the reptilians exactly. because uh yeah because um, since i had my uh session with jp and you know everything nothing is a coincidence something opened up something definitely opened up and i knew i was ready and and before meeting jp before speaking to jp the first time just a few months before i, I excuse the noise i'm sorry um the uh the I, I've been having some very strange encounters that have to do with Jesus. Very strange encounters. Um, I felt the body of Christ. Uh, this was in December. Um, it has nothing to do with Christianity. It was just pure connection with Christ, Christ consciousness. Um, and uh, I dreamt of him. I've dreamt of him before. And there was just this very strange period where I was having these very... This, this, just this strange connection. It just felt very weird. And, uh, and I kept hearing something telling me, soon it's time. You've been patient. Soon it's time. Wait. So when I met JP and we had our session, uh, we went on a journey and it was very enlightening. And then after that, I kind of opened up to myself. I started becoming more creative again because I'm a very creative person. I love creativity. But for a long time, because of all that I've been through, I've been really shut down, too busy with the stress and trying to figure myself out and everything, um, which also has a purpose. Um, and then um, I decided to send uh, you know, a, a question, the first and only question that I sent on Simon Park's show. And uh, I said to myself, I am not going to contact Simon. I'm going to wait until uh, he invites me. I, I, I really said that to myself because you know maybe he's not the right person for me you know Simon so I said I'm going to wait for the universe to invite him into my life kind of signing some sort of contract you know and uh, it happened so he actually said because Simon doesn't tell everyone you know um, just uh, contact me you know depending on the questions and uh, he said uh, let her contact me if you if she wants to contact me we can have a session on a specific question that I asked. So that was my cue. And uh, since then, we've met twice, Simon and I, and it's been um, <laughs> insane. <laughs> I, I don't even know what's the word I can use because the things that he knows, I mean, I would be having a vision and the same day we would talk and he would tell me exactly the same memory. He would say, you've been through this, this, this. And he doesn't talk a lot. He says, I'm going to give you bits and pieces. I want you to figure it out yourself. But he would give me only the information that I envisioned myself just a few hours before meeting him. So I can share this. I'm very open about it. I don't, I don't mind. I know that I'm, I have reptilian in me. I, I've known that. For a long time, because since I was a child, I've always been fascinated with uh, reptiles and dragons. And there, there's just something that draws me to them. Um, and uh, practically, he said that there is a connection with uh, a, someone in that family that uh, kind of wanted to control me. And that's exactly the vision that I had. I won't get into too much detail. But he said exactly the same thing. He said, you've run away. And this is what I keep getting back in my memories. I keep hearing from this being, who is a very powerful one in, in the reptilian uh, clan. He keeps telling me, you're a traitor. You left the clan. And I'm not, you're, you're, not going to let you go. You're mine. And I'm like, what, what the hell is this? That's, I'm crazy. You know, this is insane. And then just a few hours later, he tells me the exact same thing. So this could have to do with the vision that I had 
because it was really eerie. So well, I didn't get I, into too much detail, but I'm just like, no, 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 no. I love it. I love it. Um, my, my own personal feeling about um, the reptilians is that they being on the sort of uh, uh, the edge of the galaxy were in prime position to be affected first by AI, artificial mm-hmm. intelligence. And that as the AI is not able to progress in, in enlightenment and soul development, spirit development, it needs to conquest. It needs to go out. It needs to, you know, conquer. Conquer. In order to grow. And the reptilians were the ones that were um, the first to be infected. Now, yeah. you do this because, A, they do have a history of being warlike and aggressive, and, B, because of their unique uh, pretend, uh, propensity to conquer themselves. They, you know, were always mucking around with star families and areas of the universe and so you've got a, a particular group of people, but I don't feel it's like this this feeling that I don't feel like the reptilians are my enemy. No. I feel like the reptilians were taken over first. And you might be having something on your mic because I'm hearing feedback from scratching on your mic or something. Okay, sorry, yeah. Is this better? Yeah, thanks. Mm-hmm. Um so it, it, to to me what might have happened is that um because if you were a being of light and goodness that, that that I felt, because I sort of I sort of looked at you as a remote viewer, I can kind of like go back, I can follow you, mm-hmm. like I do with Walt, you know. Yeah. So um, what I felt from from what I was seeing was that you were of a very pure heart and couldn't even, even though you were theoretically seeing something that you you were appalled by. Uh, you walked right by it. You walked by the people that were trapped in, in the matrix. You walked by, you know, that awful image to confront what you believe was the devil or the incarnate or the, let's say the focus of evil and, um, attempt to heal, attempt to say, hey, look it, you know. But what I think was being demonstrated to me by this creature in the vomiting of all the fetuses mm-hmm. is transhumanism. You can't get yeah. to me this way because it doesn't matter to me. There is, you know, fetus is not a problem. We don't need yeah. them. And so it's, it's this continual, I'm getting hit with it every time I seem to turn around of this artificial intelligence that is not just a threat to Humanity, it's it's already uh, taken over the reptilian civilization. Yes. And that what they're doing, especially in the essence of creating this extraordinary technological, like I, you you heard Neil last week talking about how the um, the telephones were used to get the Bangladesh people to submit to mm-hmm. fingerprinting. Yeah. We're so addicted to the technology. And the technology is the only way that they can actually interface with human biological entities, i.e. you and me. True. So that's their inroad. And so when you see a society that is so hell-bent for creating this massive, there's two ways of looking at it. It's either massive control or massive information. Mm -hmm. Now, we believe it's massive information because I've watched these people continually doing things that they thought was going to gain them control and every single time it blew up in their face very true they, they killed they killed president kennedy thinking that if they do it in such a blatantly you know public manner that the fear of god will be put into everybody well a whole generation of kids said what the hell did you just do yeah you know and they went from being children into disbelief I don't believe anything you tell me because you killed the man you told me was so important. So they they take down uh, the towers in 9-11. And yes, the, the vast majority of people in the United States fell for it, but certainly the world did not. Yeah. And the people that are here speaking the truth about 9-11, and I've said this from the get-go, when they wake up to the fact that that was a lie, 
that's when this, all the cards will come down because they made it such so important in the minds of everybody that you have your son and your husband and you know your father in some instances rushing off to war to fight these terrible terrorists that are all living in the middle east yeah. you know and and oh yes yes let's do this you know so now uh, even the even you know mainstream media new york times and uh, i think it was the washington post you know are starting to listen to conspiracy people that are saying 911 couldn't happen like they said it was and yeah. so uh, when they, when when people begin to open their mind now you know i mean this orlando shooting it's the same old thing over and over and over again same and pattern more and more people are opening up to it and with the electromagnetic and the Wi-Fi controls that they've built up, well, Shungite's reversing all that. And it, when, when, Shungite, when Shungite reaches a critical mass, they'll, all of the system will switch. Once that's, that switches from the, clock, the counterclockwise rotation to clockwise, it's going to free the electromagnetic bodies all over the world called humans. Yes. So they're not, not being you know, destroyed physically. Uh, I, I don't know if you heard last night, but... Yeah, I have, I have. It was a very interesting talk, yeah. And I totally agree. It, when you see these pictures of this thermography, the, the, what they did, for those people that don't know, is that they, um, Stephanie Dietz and um, Sharon Atta, they they got a friend of theirs who has a, the ability to use thermography, which is basically a, the ability to look at a human body and see the hot spots. Now you've heard of it in in uh, you go from a uh, mammogram and then maybe if you're lucky you didn't have to take that you go right into the, the the looking inside the breast because something that is going to become cancerous shows up as a hot spot before it shows up as a 3D tumor that they can see it with with a mammogram so all this thing does is to chart the heat signature in your body now this is heat like cold, like heat, this isn't magic, this isn't anything but, you know, regular heat. And to see the pictures of uh, Sharon Atta when she had the, the phone up to her head. Now, what she did was, of course, all these people have been on Shungite for a year or more. And so she's only used to the Shungite on the phone. And so it was like, to her, physically not, and mentally, it was awful because she she's very energy sensitive. And she could feel, you know, that this was terribly damaging. But they had taken everything off of her phone. She had it up to her ear. She makes a phone call. And then they take a picture of what it looks like. And, I mean, I saw the pictures last night. And there's bright red from on, on the whole side of her face where the phone had been. It's all bright red. And then they had to, and they took pictures of her hand. Her hand that had been holding the phone was absolutely completely red. All right. Scary. Now, so they had, it took over 20 minutes for this woman to c- cool down. She she was sitting under a fan. They were trying to get her cooled down enough so that they could now test, make the same test, but this time with the Shungite stickers on the phone and her wearing a Shungite pendant. 20 minutes before everything sort of bottomed out, because they had already taken a picture of her when she hadn't been, you know, exposed to this. And when they finally got the same look, that's when they then had her pick up the phone, but now it's got the sticker on it. She's got the Shungai pendant. She does the same kind of a call, same amount of time. And when they took the pictures, her hand was completely, it looked green to me, but Seth said in the actual picture it was more of a blue um, and in the middle of the palm, there was a red spot. That's all. But her her entire hand had, had not, now no indication of heating, except for in the middle of her palm. That bothered me. I'm going like, what are we missing that we've got some red in the in her middle of her palm? You know. But yeah. regardless, we had cured. You know, no, you know, at least ninety percent of what was what had happened to her hand. And then the same situation in in her head. It was not red. There were red spots. But again, nothing, nothing like what it had been. Um, so it, it, to have that kind of uh, actual technical pictures of what Shungite is doing to free us ourselves, because these electromagnetic waves working counterclockwise are tearing us apart because our cells run and rotate clockwise. 
So you're continually trying to tear your own cells apart because you're in a, a Wi-Fi environment. Now, once that we get the shungite out there, it's enough of it out there that people begin to get balanced again. Then all of a sudden they're again human. They're yeah. in charge. And um, that to me is Gaia's gift. You know, the consciousness of Earth said, no, I've got something for you. This is going to change it. So the game plan of their control is now going to, you know, completely reverse and will be the control of the free thinkers. Yeah. So they built us a very nice platform upon which to have a massive impact on people. Thank goodness for that. Thanks to Gaia. I gotta I get you some Shanghai. You're, you're gonna just. I can't wait. I can't wait to get it. Uh, as I said, as soon as I get to Italy and I settle down, I'm definitely gonna get it. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but, but going back to the vision, this is maybe the first interpretation that makes sense. Because you were, you're absolutely right. This was pure evil. And it could be AI. You can't have a soul connection and have that much evil. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it just felt completely, de like, dead. There was nothing and no mercy, no compassion, just nothing. So, uh, obviously, um. So yeah, it's interesting, it's interesting that you saw it as the devil because to me, yeah, let's forget about this, uh, Lucifer, the, the light being, you know, being the devil. The devil is is the opposite of life, which is AI. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, when you when you are become aware of AI, uh, you realize that it makes sense now because even if the devil, you know, was evil and all that, and but still he was a creation of God, there is still divine within within him. And that's why. Evil. Yeah, that's why your your talk didn't work. Yeah, exactly. Couldn't, you couldn't connect because he doesn't have the, he can't go back to light. He can't go back to source. Unless source is some computer geek out someplace in another galaxy. Exactly. Exactly. No? Absolutely. Yeah, and you, you see this whole AI thing in, in a lot of, uh, movies and, and, um, series, uh, like sci-fi, um, everywhere. You find it everywhere. There's always the element of AI. And they're trying to tell us something. Well, it goes and, uh, back. It goes back to 2001 and Hal. Mm -hmm. You know, Hal being the the computer that you know took over because it yeah. became the sentient being in an environment of um, being isolated from humanity. I mean, what was it? What was the character? Of course, this is all fiction, right? Um, <laughs> the what what was the character's um, response to? The conditions around him, he eventually went back to Earth as a new baby. Hmm. The yeah. consciousness chose to go back home. Yeah. Because there's, you have to be around people. We, we have to be in, there, there's something about humanity, and I'm not saying not others, space families, but in humanity where we can't, we're not happy unless we got people around us. Now a lot of us <laughs> like to live alone, but um, we have such friends. Exactly. So, we're a social animal. Yes, we are. So and we're there's nothing wrong with that. No, no, there, no. That's a blessing. Exactly. We're all in this together. Nobody gets left behind. No more sacrifice. Exactly. Um, it's getting to the top of the hour. Is there? First off, we're going to lose you for a couple of weeks or whatever because of the move. We don't know when you're going to be able to to join us again. Not much. I guess maybe two weeks. It, it won't be. Hopefully, it won't be much. About okay. a couple of weeks. Yeah. But I'll definitely keep in touch. You know, we have Skype. Yes. I'll, I'll keep you. I'll keep you posted. Yes. Next week, um, Neil is coming back. He was the one that was talking about Bangladesh last week. Yeah. He's going to come back. And where I really want this show to be about different parts of the world and, and talking about, you know, geography and sociology and religion. and th That's that's the main focus on this show. But because of his unique situation and because of the time difference, um, I've offered to uh, let him talk about ex-politics and anything else that he wants to bring out in the open of his own research, of his own learning. 
Um, so it's going to be a little different uh, world talk, but it's still talking to our neighbors and finding out what they think. So um, it's in the genre of, you know, just understanding more about what the world's about by talking to people. Well, it's kind of like, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in here. No, thank you. Please do. <laughs> it's kind of like we've been saying, we're not any different, really, than anyone else anywhere else. We all have the same thoughts about things. I mean, we may not think exactly the same, but we think about the same things. You know, exopolitics over there, exopolitics here, Australia, UK, everywhere. You know, the same as with we, we all talk religion and sexuality and what's going on in the world and all, you know, governments. We all talk about those things and family and food and fashion sometimes. So True. we're not that different. And I think that this show, and especially you, Nancy, because, you know, I don't say much, it's a wonderful, wonderful idea that you had to pull it all together. And I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you, Nora, for being a frequent guest with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you I want both. to thank Nora for traveling all over the world to have so many great stories. <laughs> <laughs> you and me, you know, we live in a one one room here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's marvelous to, to yeah, it, well, we couldn't do it without you, Colleen, because, you know, you Absolutely. said, let's have a show at one o'clock. <laughs> what are we going to do? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate the time, uh, you know, the, the time that you chose I mean, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely more convenient for sure. Um, I just want to say one last thing. It's, I want to share this because I'm a little, I'm kind of excited. Um, after I settle down and, you know, I'm, everything's okay in, in Italy, I am going to go to Edinburgh for a few days uh, because I'm, I'm doing a course. Um, and most probably I am going to go down to Whitby to meet oh. Simon. <laughs> so, cool. I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm really excited. And I will share the experience. So he, he told me, come over, we'll have lunch. And it will be, I think, a very interesting talk. So maybe whenever I come back on the show, I will share uh, any insights or anything that I've learned from him. Because I think he's a very interesting person. He, he just fascinates me. When's this going to happen? I'm not sure, but it, I mean, it depends on when he's available. So I'm going to check with him. But be, before autumn, before fall. We'll have to get you some Shanghai. You can give it to him. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. That, well, then, then that's done. I'm going to settle in, talk to you about it, see how we can do this, and I'll have it for him. Yep. Awesome. And you. I want you to experience it, too. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Okay. Love you both. Thank, Thank you, you too. for being with us. We hope that um, we've brightened your day, that you had a little fun in our sandbox. <laughs> Uh, it's yours here. All righty. Well, we thank you all for listening. We'll see you all later. Thank coming you. Up, uh, coming up next is the fans. Uh, no, it isn't. Back up, back up, back up. <laughs> is Haggy Reads for you. I forgot me. And I'm reading still The Children of the Law of One, The Lost Teachings of Atlantis by John Peniel. And then after that, of course, is the Fans of Whitley Strieber show. And we have Dreamland and Jeremy Bainey's The Experience and also An Awakenings. So Nancy and I probably won't get a chance to speak of it later because it's going to be about, mm, I don't know, maybe three-ish hours. And then after that, I've got a new thing that I'm starting to do. Uh, Awake Radio's Devon, uh, uh, also known as Sky Streak, s- is sending me pods of their show, so I'm going to be playing that uh, at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. That's 6 o'clock Pacific Time. And that's a two-hour show, and that's, their show is called Rise in Awakening, so that ought to be interesting. And that's in an Australian uh, radio station. Well, they have uh, Awake Radio US. Oh, do they? UK oh. and Australia. So cool. uh, they have some interesting things on there. And I thought 
you know, we are wanting to network with other stations, with other people who have something to say. We want their voices heard as well. Right. So I'm going to be bringing in some of that as well. Excellent. And with that said, I will... Just let me say one more thing. Nora, no. have a great trip. Be safe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Be safe. Uh, you know, you, you start in the first part of the next part of your life, and it's just so exciting. Plus, we yeah. get to learn about Italy, Colleen. I know. <laughs> love you guys. Bye. I love, you, love too. you, too. Bye-bye. Be safe. Be safe. Nice. Be Good safe. Night. Bye. Thank you for visiting. You have been listening to World Talk with Friends, a Haggy Shack radio production simulcast over the Wolf Spirit Media Network.